Hi guys and welcome to our vlog. It's me, Alicia, with my cousin George. That's me by the way. And today we want to talk to you about the movies because we've just seen an awesome short film that was shot entirely on a smartphone and they absolutely smashed it so we decided to give it a shot too but it wasn't as easy as it looks here are five lessons we learned that we think every filmmaker should know check this out Writing the script is the hardest part of the process. Where do you even start? The important thing is to be realistic. Obviously, filmmakers like us can't use a film studio. So we're playing it safe with a simple story that's a maximum of five minutes long. Short sure is always good. It's harder for the audience to follow the plot if it's really long and complicated. Oh, and don't write in too many characters either. Our film is a simple story about a group of teenagers with our friends playing the main roles. And you'll probably play a part too, won't you Alicia? You're kidding right? I want to direct! And that brings me on to lesson number two. Be creative and collaborate. The most important thing is to be original. All you need is one simple idea that you can explore. And to get that, you should brainstorm. Okay, what would happen if there was no gravity? Great idea! But it might be tricky to film. Oh yeah. I need to give that a little bit more thought. <sighs> Once you're happy with your script and you found your actors, that's me in our case, then it's time to practice. That's lesson number three. Of course, you should always rehearse the lines, but it's a good idea to practice the movements too. Okay, now smile at the camera and then turn around and just walk away. Brilliant. Finally, when you're ready, check the location and the weather, especially if you're filming outside. You want a nice quiet place to film and you don't want to shoot in the rain. And... It looks like it's going to be sunny for our filming this afternoon. Excellent. And I've got the props. Sorted. Right then, guys. Camera rolling and... Hey! That's my line. Action! You're a natural. All right. Let's do this. And I can use this. Hey! The director uses that. No, they don't. You need someone else to use it. Um, that's not true. I want to do it. Hi, Joe. What's up? Hi, Kieran. I'm outside the cinema now. Where are you? I'm on the bus. Don't worry. I'll be there soon. What time is the film? 5.30. But there are usually about 15 minutes of adverts first. What happened? This week there is an extra study class after school. Next week it will be back to normal times. Is Rachel with you? No. I told her to meet us at the cafe after the film. OK, cool. The bus is arriving now. I'll see you in five minutes. Great. I've got the tickets. We can go in when you get here. See you soon. Welcome to the Sharing Creativity podcast. This week we're talking about how to create a successful blog. With me are three bloggers. First of all, can you introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Sarah from Brighton in the UK 
and I write a fashion blog called Wearing It Out. Hey, I'm Katie from Chicago in the US. My blog, Into Focus, is all about films, film production, and the directors who make them. Hello, everyone. My name's Hannah. I'm from Dublin in Ireland, and I blog about food and cookery. My blog is called Making Meals. Thank you, everyone. Now, very quickly, what's your number one tip for successful blogging? That's easy. Write about what you love. People will relate to you and your blog much better. Good point. Do something new, something different from other people. That's great advice. I'll say don't be boring. Quickly say what you want to say. And don't write too much. Let's talk more about getting started. Hannah, what are your thoughts? When you know what you want to write about, and I think this is the hardest part, it's a good idea to spend time thinking about what you're interested in as a reader. I came up with lots of ideas this way, and that really helped me when I started writing. That's a great way to start. It's also important to spend a lot of time looking at other blogs for ideas. You might notice what is missing and what you can do better. What I noticed was that most were serious, so I decided to be funny. It's important to be different from everyone else and be original. I did the same thing and realized that what wasn't there was personality. I decided to write about myself. It really helped my readers to get to know me. I'm also glad I could be honest with people. I agree. Anything that you can do that helps you connect with your readers is great. These days, I often ask my readers to suggest topics for me to write about. Great ideas. To finish off, any final pieces of advice for our listeners? Yes, remember, stories are a great way to get your point across. Anything else? Ignore negative comments. Not everyone will like what you do. Think about the good ones and don't give up. On the Turning Pages podcast this week, we're talking about the weirdest and most wonderful books we've read. Knowing you, Trev, I guess you have a lot of recommendations. Yes. First of all, I want to talk about Paget Powell's The Interrogative Mood. I actually started reading it at the weekend and I've almost finished. And what's so strange about it? Every sentence in the book is a question that the writer asks the reader. How long is it? 176 pages. It sounds really bad, but actually I thought it was great. I can't remember reading a book like it ever. Wow. Well, the book I'm going to talk about isn't quite like that. I found out about it on another podcast a few days ago and went to buy it. It's called Gadsby and it's by Ernest Vincent Wright. And the only special thing about it was that the whole book doesn't contain the letter E. Really? But why? I have no idea. <laughs> Did you like it? Well, I didn't read it. I left it on my desk yesterday when I went to lunch. When I came back, it had disappeared. Do you know who took it? Not yet, but I'm looking for them. <laughs> well, that's just as strange as any of these books, isn't it? You're right. Brainstorming is a great way to generate ideas or solve problems. It uses techniques that encourage our brains to become more creative, either on your own or in a team. 
It can help you think about all the possibilities available and get lots of ideas in a short amount of time. Before we look at some techniques, I want to share three rules. One, if you're brainstorming in a group, start off on your own. If people have some time before to think about the problem, they will come to the meeting feeling more relaxed and confident. Two, it's all about the number of ideas you have, not how good they are. The more ideas that you have, the better chance you will have of finding a good idea. Finally, three, don't criticise bad ideas. You want everyone to feel they can share their ideas. People won't do this if you tell them they are bad or stupid. So, let's talk about a few techniques. In my article about creative thinking, I mentioned quick-fire questions and this is a great technique to use to get lots of ideas very quickly. But when you have a team of people who aren't so confident speaking, try brain writing. This is when each person writes an idea on a piece of paper. You then collect the papers and give them out to different people who add ideas or comment on the idea they have. It's a great way to get everyone involved. If you don't want to write your ideas down, you can try round-robin brainstorming. You go round the table and ask each person for one idea. After you've done this, go round again. This time, each person can either give another idea or comment on an idea someone else said. What I like about this is that everyone has an equal chance to speak. But however you brainstorm, enjoy it, have fun and be positive. Good luck! As far as I'm concerned, films are much better than books. They are much quicker to watch and you get to see and hear how each character really is. They're much more powerful. What does everyone else think? Personally, I much prefer books. When you think about it, you can get much more involved with a book. There is so much more detail in them, and you can take them anywhere. Would you agree with that? Good point. With a book, you can also read at your own speed and go back over something again. And in my experience, books can also really help you learn new words. Can I stop you there? I'd take a different view on that. Films and TV shows can also help you learn new words and foreign languages. My friend Gabriel learned English as a kid from watching American cartoons. You can't do that with a novel in a language you don't understand. I'm not sure I agree. Both books and films can help you learn a foreign language. All things considered, I prefer books. You get to use your imagination when you read and invent your own world. Don't you think that's really important? I couldn't agree more. And it's a fact that kids who read more do better at school. Hang on a moment. Are you sure that's true? Yes, I am. There's a lot of research to show it. Well, I'm not sure I agree. Hi guys, Alicia here and in today's video I want to talk to you about travelling. As you know, I often share holiday photos online. I also check recommendations for my next travel destinations on social media. Obviously, I know that in some of these photos the colours or lights were improved or special filters were used. Fine by me, but one day I visited a place 
that was nothing like the picture. I was so disappointed and, well, angry. In this video, I'll tell you my huge photo disappointment story. And a few friends, including George, will share their own experiences. Ready? Here we go. Visiting Bali had been on my bucket list for ages. Just look at this gorgeous scenery. It looks like it's on top of a mountain, surrounded by this amazing, peaceful lake. Impressive, right? Mm, not really. Everyone who wants to take a photo has to get a ticket with a number and then wait their turn. In my case, it was two hours, but some wait longer. And I'm not the only one this has happened to. Thanks, Alicia. James here. And my story started with this picture of a valley in the mountains in Poland. You can see the grassland stretching into the distance, covered with hundreds of purple spring flowers. I'm a photographer and I love this image. So I decided to go there and take some pictures. The minute I got there, I realised it was a bad idea. There were people and cars everywhere. They were even treading on the flowers. I didn't see the point in staying there. So, in the end, I just walked away to this woodland area and found this beautiful mountain stream. At least I still got my picture. Hi guys, I'm Becky. When my brother and I were planning a trip to Vietnam, we made a list of all the places we had to see. Most of our ideas were from travel vlogs we like. Pongor Waterfall was at the top of our list because of this photo. But when we went, it looked like this. Okay, it was partly our fault. We were there during the dry season, when there wasn't as much water going down the waterfall. Despite that, the place was magical and we spent a lot of time just admiring the landscape. My family usually spends holidays at the seaside. Last year, we chose the south coast of Italy, called the Amalfi Coast. We arrived there by ferry, and as we got near Amalfi, the view was absolutely breathtaking. Just like the photos, with houses on the edges of the cliffs, there was so much we wanted to do, like rent a car and drive through all the little villages and towns, or, or see the Emerald Grotto, a beautiful cave famous for its green underground water. We didn't want to miss out on anything, but there was one thing we didn't expect. Crowds. After a couple of hours sitting in traffic jams with hundreds of other tourists, we were dead tired and wanted to find a quieter holiday spot. Thanks guys. It sounds like it's not worth looking for holiday inspiration on social media because when a place gets popular, everyone goes there. It's as simple as that. Or maybe we just need to do a bit more research before we pack our bags. What do you think? What kind of things can't you imagine living without? A mobile phone with internet connection? Your own bed? Hot water in the shower? Zeki Bashan, a man in his early 20s from Scotland, would probably see it differently. Since he was a child, Zeki has preferred spending time outdoors to watching TV or playing computer games. At the age of 16, 
He started studying at the School of Adventure Studies at West Highland College on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. The course he chose involved developing various outdoor skills, such as hiking, climbing, or kayaking. Although the classes were very practical, Zeki wanted to go one step further and put into practice what he was learning. To see what it was like to survive in the wild on his own, Zeki decided to put up a tent and live there during his studies. There weren't many things he needed an old camp bed, two blankets, and a large metal box for storing his clothes and books. As he was living alone, Zeki had to do everything by himself. This meant getting up early, making a fire, and cooking breakfast. Then he had to walk for thirty minutes to get to school. Zeki didn't have a shower or a washing machine. He washed himself and his clothes in the river. Then he dried them by the fire. After school, he had to collect wood for the next day. In his free time, Zeki explored the hills and woodland areas or stayed in the tent, cutting things out of wood. Zeki has always lived surrounded by nature. He grew up in the wild parts of the Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland. His house was far from other villages and towns. In winter, it was often difficult to get there, so Zeki's family had to use cross country skis to bring food. During his childhood, Zeki travelled a lot to remote villages in different parts of the world, where his mother, a cookbook author, studied the food of local communities. For Zeki, this was a chance to learn something from people who lived close to nature. Currently, Zeki continues to travel and develop his passions. During his last trip to Namibia, he was learning survival skills from the San Bushmen community. In winter, he worked as a glacier guide in Iceland, where he was teaching others how to hike on ice trails safely. When he doesn't travel, Zeki works as a survival skills instructor in Scotland. He shows others how to make fire or how to find food or water in the wild. Welcome to the 8th annual Westview Secondary School debate. I'm here with two of our students, Elizabeth Martin and Timothy Perry. The topic of today's debate is Global warming is the biggest threat in the 21st century. Elizabeth, you're the first speaker. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. I absolutely agree with that statement. Global warming is the biggest problem our generation will have to face. First of all, experts predict that global warming will affect not only weather, but it'll also lead to hundreds of animals and plants dying. Additionally, when the sea levels rise, many areas along the coast will become unsuitable for living. Thousands or maybe even millions of people will have to find new homes. What's more, global warming will without any doubt result in poorer health of many people. For instance, those who suffer from heart diseases. Obviously, a lot of insects that pass diseases such as mosquitoes enjoy warmer weather so we might expect that their population will increase together with the risk of the diseases. Furthermore, 
Heat waves and droughts might have huge impact on farming and access to drinking water. Some scientists predict that soon there might not be enough drinking water and food for all people. So, as we have seen, global warming will affect all aspects of our lives, food, houses and our health. In my opinion, there isn't a single more serious threat than that. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now our second speaker, Timothy Perry. Elizabeth has said that global warming will have consequences like lack of food or extreme weather. These are clearly extremely worrying predictions. However, I have to disagree with the statement that global warming is the biggest threat in the 21st century. Firstly, we can see that different countries and organisations have already done a lot to slow down global warming. I strongly believe their actions won't allow Elizabeth's scenario to take place. Secondly, both the development of modern technologies and popularity of the internet have caused completely new problems to appear. A growing number of people spend more time online than offline surrounded by their friends. Definitely, technology is slowly taking control of our lives. I can't stop thinking about the dangers it might cause. For example, cyber attacks, cyber terrorism, or even creating super intelligent artificial intelligence that will want to have power over people. These are, in my view, the greatest threats of the modern world. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this week's arts programme. Today we're talking to writer Paula Sanchez from Argentina. Welcome, Paula. You've written two novels which have been very successful globally and you also write articles for newspapers and magazines in your own country. And now you're writing your first non-fiction book. What's it about? Good morning. Well, obviously in the last few years there have been many changes to how we read because of technology. So I decided to write a book about those changes, what the situation is now and what the future of printed books looks like. A few years ago it didn't look good at all. Everyone was using electronic books, mainly because they were cheaper. But it seems that while digital media continues to have a negative effect on newspapers and magazines, people still love printed books. Why do you think that is, Paula? Well, there are probably several reasons. The cost of e-readers and e-books has increased, so price isn't as big an issue as before. Also, we spend so much time every day looking at screens that we can end up suffering from digital fatigue. In other words, we're tired of technology and a printed book gives us a welcome break. And of course, books can be more attractive visually with beautiful designs and images. We like collecting them and displaying them on bookshelves in our homes, and we also enjoy giving them to friends and family as gifts. While it's true that many people still read romantic novels or ones about crime as e-books, they usually prefer printed books on subjects like cooking or the natural world. Oh, and it's not only books. People are buying more paper maps, too. Activities like walking and cycling are becoming more popular. And when we're out in the environment exploring, we don't always want to rely on technology. Phone signals can fail, and batteries sometimes stop working. 
but nothing can go wrong with a paper map. So the future looks fascinating. Sales figures show that younger people are actually buying more printed books than older people. I think it will be very interesting to see what happens in classrooms, and how students will be using printed books in the future. Thank you so much, Paula, and good luck with your new book. And now we talk. Hi, guys! Today we've got some good news. According to this article, the country's getting healthier. No way! How come? This says that the number of people who have taken time off work because they're ill is at its lowest ever. Last year, people took on average only four sick days from work, and students missed only six days from school. But they don't know why. Hang on a sec. I've got an idea. My mate James is studying medicine. He'll have some thoughts on why that's happening. Let's give him a call. Okay, bit random, but could work, I guess. Hello. Hey, James. It's George. How are you doing? Hey, man. I'm not great, to be honest. I think I've got a cold. Or the flu. Or a chest infection. Apart from that, I'm epic. Thanks, mate. Oh, um, what happened? To cut a long story short, I was out for a run this morning, and I was out of breath. That isn't unusual. But when I got home, I felt terrible. I had a really sore throat and a pain in my chest. I thought I was having a heart attack. You know I don't like to complain, but I'm really, really ill. So now I'm just resting, drinking lots of water, and I've got an appointment with the doctor later. Ah,、uh, okay. We'll leave you alone then. I hope you get better soon. Me too. Okay, that wasn't very useful. I know. My friend Becky's really into fitness. She might have some thoughts on why we're healthier these days. Good idea. Hello. Hey Becky, how are you doing? I'm great, except I woke up the other morning with a terrible pain and my arm was all red. I thought maybe it was a bit of burn, you know, from the sun, but it kept getting worse. So I went to the doctor. Turns out it was an infection from a really bad mosquito bite. Whilst I was there, I told her about this backache, and she said I needed to rest. I'm not supposed to move for the rest of the day. I should really be in bed. Sorry, Becky. I'll leave you to it. Get well soon. Thanks. It still really hurts. Oh. Okay. Are you sure we're getting healthier, Alicia? That's what the statistics say. I guess our friends are the exceptions that prove the rule. <laughs> They must be. What do you guys think? Are you getting healthier? Send us your comments. And thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. My knees hurt when I run. I think you need to cut down on the amount of running that you do, and try swimming instead. It's important to keep on doing some exercise. 
Did you put on any weight when you were on holiday? Yes, I did, but I don't understand why. I did lots of sport every day. I'm just trying to work out how that happened. Do you think we should stop eating sugary foods altogether? I think it depends on what else you're eating. I mean, there is plenty of natural sugar in the food we eat. Fruits, vegetables and even milk contain sugar. So, you know, we probably have more than enough anyway. Listen, the point I want to get across is that you don't need sugar in your diet. Please go ahead and explain your conclusions. Many people today are going on about the health benefits of a vegetarian diet. They say that it can help prevent heart attacks, protect you from many diseases, and may even improve your mood and stop you feeling depressed. There's so much different health advice today, it's hard to work out what is fact and what isn't. But I'm sure my two guests can solve some of those problems. They are Dr Zoe Baxter and scientist Patrick Reed. Firstly, let's talk about water. Should we drink two litres every day? That is the popular view. Unfortunately, it just isn't necessarily true. In fact, how much water we need depends on what we're doing, what we're eating. Because, as we know, fruit and vegetables contain a lot of water and, of course, what the temperature is. And we don't need to drink just water. Any drink with water in it, including tea and coffee, is fine. And what about coffee? Is it good for us or not? I think it depends on how much you drink. Caffeine, the chemical in coffee that keeps us awake and the main reason people drink it, can cause your heart to beat faster and high blood pressure. However, coffee also contains chemicals called polyphenols, which can lower blood pressure and reduce the risk of a heart attack too. So, is it OK to keep on drinking it then? Go ahead. But I wouldn't drink more than a few cups a day. One fruit that everyone seems to be going on about recently is avocados. And I'll be honest, I sometimes eat three or four a day. You might want to cut down to one or two. They do contain some good fats, which may protect you from a heart attack, but so does olive oil, some fish and nuts. But you should realise that one avocado contains about 240 calories. That's a lot. And if you're eating four a day, that's almost half the total calories you need, which may cause you to put on weight. Oh, I see. Perhaps I'll replace my morning avocado with a fruit smoothie instead. I don't think that's a good idea. If you actually add up the sugar in a smoothie, you'll find some have higher levels than a can of cola. Really? But the ones I drink are 100% natural. That doesn't matter. Sugar is sugar, natural or not. I really want to get this across to your listeners. And that much sugar in one go is not good for you. I would suggest you try eating an apple or a banana instead. Thanks a lot. On Medical Marvel's podcast this week, we're talking about some of the greatest medical achievements of recent years. At the University of Utah in the USA, scientists have managed to make an artificial arm and hand that patients can move by just using their thoughts. That's amazing! They also designed the arm so that the people using them can feel the things that they pick up, just like a real hand. 
The next achievement is all about 3D printing. In recent years, scientists have discovered that they can 3D print some body parts using both plastic and living human cells. They have already succeeded in printing hearts, skin, and teeth, although they haven't been able to use them on real human patients yet. Incredible! The last achievement I want to talk about isn't actually a scientific one, but it has succeeded in improving the health of millions of people. We're talking about the smoking ban here. In countries around the world, from Canada to Argentina and the UK to Australia, smoking is no longer allowed in public places. In some countries, like the UK, we can already see a reduction in the number of people smoking and an improvement in health. Today, I want to talk about some of the strategies that we can use to manage our emotions better when something bad happens to us. So, let's imagine you've lost something that was very important to you. How would you feel? You may experience sadness, regret, perhaps even anger. This could be with yourself because you think that you're responsible for what happened. This is called self-blame. Or it could be with other people you think are responsible, blaming others. Which brings me to the first strategy, acceptance. If we can accept what has happened was an accident, stop fighting it and blaming ourselves or others for it, we can start to feel better more quickly. It is also a good idea to name and write down your emotions as you experience them, and ask yourself why you are feeling like this. Research shows that when we do this, we begin to feel more in control over what is happening, which helps us turn a negative experience into something more positive. Let's look at another situation. A very good friend has moved to another city. You probably feel sad that they've gone. You may be feeling lonely too. This is quite normal, but when you spend too much time thinking about these negative emotions, this is called rumination or deep thinking, and it can make us ill. Instead, you can try and think about all the happy times you had together and how lucky you are to have this person as a friend. We call this strategy positive refocusing. You can also take this one step further and start making plans to visit your friend in their new home and focusing on the exciting times you will have together in the future. This is an excellent strategy, which we call refocus on planning. Let's get into groups now and look at some tasks to practice these ideas. I think this would be one of the worst feelings. I know that I'd feel annoyed with myself for losing it, and I'd also be experiencing a lot of anxiety and worry. Mm, yes, it would be terrible. But I guess we have to accept that it's gone and then decide what we're going to do to improve the situation. So why be anxious and worry? Hmm. Well... I won't be able to contact my friends and family, and also someone else might have it and be using it. Mm. So, let's refocus our thoughts on planning. First of all, let's go to the information desk at the festival. They can help us contact friends and family. Good idea. And then someone in our family can use their phone to lock mine and track its location. That's true. And then perhaps we can remind ourselves that we're at this amazing festival and we can still have a great time even without it. Hello. How can I help you? I've been bitten by an insect on my leg and it really hurts. 
Could you recommend something? Would I be able to see the bite? Yes, of course. Oh, it looks very red. Does it hurt when you touch it? Yes, it does. It's really sore. Can you tell me when this happened? Two days ago. Have you put anything on it yet? What do you mean by that? Any cream? No, I haven't. Do you know if you are allergic to any medicine? I'm afraid I didn't quite catch that. Is there anything you can't take? No, I don't think so. I think the best course of action is to take this cream. You'll need to apply a small amount to the bite with your finger. OK. How often do I use it? About two or three times a day. It's really important that you wash your hands before and after you do it. Is that clear? Sorry, do you think you could repeat that last part? Of course. You must wash your hands before and after you apply the cream. OK, I understand. Thank you.